I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Lamentations, because it's an up kind of day. Lamentations, man, that, that's a ominous uh, title for a book, and uh, it carries a lot of, a lot of heavy, and uh, we're going to find that that heavy actually is something that can lift some heavy from us, and so Lamentations, and the best way to find it is to go to Jeremiah and then go one page beyond Jeremiah, and you'll find Lamentations, uh, both written by Jeremiah. Jeremiah, responsible for He's uh, number four on guys who produce the most material in the Bible. Number four in that list, Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah is a big book, and you add lamentations to it, and uh, you, you got a lot of word from God's word coming from this one guy. We're talking, uh, Jimmy introduced this last week in uh, this new series. We're talking about storm proof. And here's the thing about storms in life is that they're, they're going to come. And you can prepare for them at some levels, and you can weather them at some level, and then you do some cleanup at some level once the storm is passed. And we're looking at all those things as we work our way through Stormproof. And today, uh, multiple passages from this book called Lamentations, which is a fascinating, I don't even go into all this today, but this is a fascinating read. It is... Uh, very complex poetry, lots of acrostics in Hebrew uh, used to describe all these things. And you see some of that in some of your translations as uh, each paragraph begins with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Each first word in each sentence begins the same letter. Uh, I'm going to say this before I jump into the sermon. Today, we're baptizing outside for the first time. Usually the first Sunday of May is when we baptize outside. And I want to throw this out now, and I'll mention it again at the end of the hour. But baptism is such a beautiful picture of what Christ has done for us. It's, it's the testimony of a life that has been changed for, for time and for eternity because of faith in Jesus Christ, surrendering our lives to him. And so we have some folks being baptized today. But here's what I want to say to you, let you be processing this, is some of you, you've you made that commitment to Christ, but believer's baptism, that personal acted out declaration of what Christ has done in your heart, maybe you have never taken that step before. And we actually have things available that if you didn't come with a change of clothes, we can take care of you pretty well today. And maybe today is the day for you to be baptized. And so I want to throw that out now. And all you're going to have to do at the end of this hour when I, I'm going to leave a little bit early, Roger's going to close our service, is just follow me out, and we will celebrate life in Christ today. That could be, this could be a very special day uh, for you, for your family, for uh, your friends. So uh, keep those things in mind today, too. Now, stormproof. So I grew up in Victoria, Texas, the coastal bend of uh, South Texas. And Victoria, one of the things that we learned about early on was uh, getting ready for hurricanes because they were just going to happen. Uh, the month before I was born, Victoria, uh, Hurricane Carla came through and took the roof off my parents' house. They, they're from Arkansas. They learned a lot about hurricanes quickly, what a hurricane can do. And uh, we began making preparations. We, we lived about five miles out of town when I was growing up. And uh, my dad, he had these specially cut squares, uh, rectangles of plywood, all numbered. We kept them in our barn in the back. And he, okay, storm's going to hit us. We go get, our, go get our boards. They're all numbered. You just found which, okay, sticking that one in, sticking that one in. And we were all good to go when the storms came, did those sorts of things, cleaned up a little bit, made sure everything was squared away, stored away in the barn. Sometimes... Sometimes we stayed, depending on where the storm was coming in. Sometimes we, we, got in, we, we loaded up and we left town, uh, depending on where it was projected to hit. Because where we lived, the Guadalupe River uh, wasn't that far from our house, and it would cut us off from everything if it, it covered the highways in and out. So we'd be locked out. We lost uh, water 
electricity and uh, access to food, uh, we decided that's when we'd leave. And sometimes uh, that's, uh, that's the way things happen. One summer, as a college student, I was working at, uh, for Brown and Root, uh, and they were responsible for maintenance for a carbide plastics and chemicals plant. And so they hired college students to come out in the summer and just do things no one else wanted to do, I guess. It seemed to be how the job went for me. And, and there were about 25 of us, and most days, you know, they threw us on the back of a flatbed trailer They'd haul us out, and they'd just say, you get off here and have fun all day doing that, and we'd do it. Well, the summer I was there, uh, a hurricane was coming into the Gulf. It was going to hit the coast, the Gulf Coast somewhere. Probably, it was projected, it could have happened anywhere from uh, Mississippi on through Texas. Weren't sure where it was going to hit. And so, at a place like that, and by the way, the, the place I worked was located in Sea Drift, Texas. If you're working at a large plastics and chemicals plant in Sea Drift, Texas, you're probably close to water. So they perk up a little more maybe than a lot of people would. And uh, they got the first, first warning. And then they had all kinds of protocols for this. So the first level, it's coming in. We're probably going to get a lot of rain no matter what. So first thing we do, they sent sent us out you were just picking up trash and debris there you know they pulled insulation off of pipes and piled it up somewhere well we got to clean that up we don't want anything loose that could be flying around so we started doing that kind of stuff then it's coming closer and closer it's projected to come in uh, much closer to sea drift than they originally said and so now next alert well okay everything starts getting put away we, we're looking like us in our barn we're, we're locking away equipment and we're putting away things that are just loose. Uh, there's not, not going to be any lumber for, that's sitting around. There's not going to be any material sitting out. We're going to put everything away. And then they said, that thing is coming in at Sea Drift, Texas. And so now we are, we've gone through several layers of preparation for the storm that's coming. And now it's at the highest level. And I'll never forget the day walking along with uh, my foreman who'd been there for a long time. And he was great with a bunch of dumb college students. He, uh, he's just pointing. And so I had my channel lock pliers on my belt always because I use those just about every day for something crazy they put me on. And uh, he handed me a roll of wire, heavy, fairly heavy wire. And he said, self because that's what set on my hard hat. Self, I need you to go over there and tie down that bulldozer to that pole. Well, I'd taken physics. <laughs> and so, I'm not, I, ordinarily I wouldn't challenge a whole lot, but I'm not a smart aleck kind of guy. But I said, Man, if, if that bulldozer takes flight, I'm pretty sure this wire and that pole aren't going to help much. And he said, just tie down the bulldozer, college boy. And that is what I did. I tied that bulldozer with a piece of wire to a pole. <laughs> now, what happened is that it's one of those that it's coming, to, it's coming in at Sea Drift, Texas. They're pretty sure. And it ended up veering off, losing a whole lot of energy, and it came in uh, um, just barely at hurricane level. Lots of wind, lots of water, but not, not the devastating kind of stuff. It didn't have a lot of tornadoes wrapped up in it. And so a lot of our people, though, they had abandoned. Well, they, they took off as far as they could get away, get from the coast. And uh, there were only a few of us out of the whole plant that were back on Monday morning for work. And, that, and it was a mess. And we started cleaning up. Because after a mess, there's cleanup to be done. What do you do in life when storms come? When and you receive not, not just a little bit of a storm, not just a, a breeze that messes up your hair, but the kind that starts wrecking things, a major body blow to your life. What do you do when it feels like life is falling apart? How do you find strength to go on when you have encountered tremendous tragedy in life? And... and 
you know, the truth is we're all going to face losses in life. There are things we're going to lose. As I get older, I discover, well, my body doesn't work the way it used to. And there are things I have lost. And some of you have been so faithful to pray and encourage in relationship to my vision, my eyes. And uh, I'm actually uh, going to finish the series by just telling that story from beginning to end to today. Um, but uh, loss, when things were a certain way and then they're not. And that's just a physical thing. Sometimes it's, it's family things. That somebody you love that just isn't around anymore. And if we live long enough, we're going to say goodbye to people we love. And those things are hard things. When they're there one day and the next day they're not there. And sometimes it's just when a relationship that you thought was going to be till death do us part. Uh, parts ways a lot earlier. And sometimes it's the doctor who says, hey, why don't we sit down and talk about this? Because uh, the word is not a good word. Sometimes just an accident throws everything into turmoil when all your future plans were rolling along this direction and then all that's out the window. And you're not going where you thought you were going in life when uh, that job that you were planning on because, well, you know, it helps what with food and uh, shelter and whatnot to have a job that suddenly that job the rug just pulled out from under you and you're not sure what the future holds how do you find strength to go on well that's where Jeremiah comes in so here's this man in the Bible named Jeremiah and he asks some of those big questions how do you go on when when everything is is going bad and he went through one of the most horrendous times in the history of God's people so he's this is uh, uh, late 7th early 6th century B.C. He's in Jerusalem. He is the prophet of God, the voice of God to his generation. Isaiah had uh, been that voice in a previous generation, and things turned around, and things got better, and God delivered. But that was not going to be the case in Jeremiah's day. And things got worse, and things didn't get better, and the people didn't turn around, and God's judgment was going to come. And, and it came at the hands of uh, the king of Babylon, and so he comes in to everything Jeremiah knows, everything that he loves, most everybody he's related to. And his nation was ravaged by the people of Babylon. Uh, in fact, the entire nation taken captive as slaves, the only people left, the poorest of the poor is how the Bible describes it. He take, they're taken from their homeland and taken off to Babylon where they are resettled. They have lost touch with everything that they know. In Jeremiah's lifetime, he has seen atrocities. He has seen inhumanities done to his people, done to his family, done to those he loved. And he's, and he's witnessed the temple in Jerusalem dedicated to the worship of his God torn apart, burned to the pieces and and so what, what you get is he's, he writes down this journey in that prophecy book that bears his name, Jeremiah. And after the fact, when it is all done with great intent and purpose and structure, he writes the book of Lamentations, a book of poetry where he laments the situation. Now, he wrote what he lived and lived what he wrote in, in the middle of this national tragedy and a whole lot of personal tragedy where he lost so much of what he loved and cared about. He wrote the book of Lamentations. And out of all the Bible, David will do this in the Psalms. You read through the Psalms and sometimes he's just crying out to God. You get a lot of that with, with Jeremiah. It's a, it's a guttural uh, kind of kind of a, expressing things to God and he says lamentation I'll read several things from lamentations most of them from chapter 3 lamentations 347 says we have suffered terror and pitfalls ruin and destruction streams of tears flow from our eyes because of the my eyes because of the destruction of my people and then he says in chapter 2 verse 11 I have cried until the tears no longer come. 
My heart is broken. My spirit poured out as I see what's happened to my people. This is what despair sounds like. What uh, seeming hopelessness sounds like. And if you came to church today and you're feeling some despair, you're feeling some hopelessness, or maybe it's just you're dragging and you're feeling low and you're discouraged for any number of reasons. Uh, know, first of all, that you probably have a pretty good reason for it. And the reason you feel that is because you have a heart and you're taking breath. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at how do you keep going when that is your experience and how do you find strength to go on after the tragedy and uh, after a great loss of life how do you pick up and you carry forward and in Jeremiah's case look at this book of Lamentations there are four big things that stand out to me about how you how you prepare how you weather the storm but especially today we'll talk about how do you come out the other side of what feels devastating here's the first one focus your attention on God and these are extremely profound things all the way through just like this boy uh, yeah focus your attention on God you ought to know that one right what's the right answer to a question about any need God's the right answer but doing it's a different thing you focus your attention on God and you, that means you take time to be quiet you get alone with him you're not just complaining toward him in the general direction but you actually spend some time with him and there's a big difference between those things in uh, Lamentations 3.28 when life is heavy and hard uh, to, to take go off by yourself enter this from the message paraphrase enter the silence bow in prayer don't, don't ask questions just wait for hope to appear Stop talking so much and listen for what God has to say to you is Jeremiah's message. Did you know that God wants to talk to you? And people, oh yeah, I know that. I don't think you do. Not like God wants, you to, wants to talk to you. You know, God wants to talk to you. He has a word for you. He, he's, he hasn't forgotten you in the midst of your struggles. He wants to talk to you much more than we want to listen to what he has to say. And people say, well, I'm, I'm open-minded, but most people still don't think that God really has a word for them. And the reason they don't think that is because they've never taken time to listen, to, to be still. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, be still, God says, and know that I am God. It's hard for us to be still. And the reason we don't hear God very often is because we are way too busy. Yeah, busy. Always, and I've, I've gone almost a year without saying this, so I must say it. Ask anybody anywhere in Collin County, hey, how's it going? What are they going to tell you? Oh, it's May. I am so busy in May. May is much more demanding than December, I believe, and all the things wrapped around Christmas. There's so many things that are calling for our time, attention, and efforts in the month, merry, merry month of May. I am so busy. And, and so just go ahead and substitute for busy and say, I am so sinful. Oh, yes, yeah, some of you remember. Go ahead and say that. Hey, how's it going? I am so sinful. I've allowed my life to get so full of stuff, so full of busy, so full of activities, uh, so full of myself that I don't have any time for God. I am so sinful busy. Now, uh, why don't we talk to God? Well, it's because we're busy. Back uh, when I was, especially when I was in college, out of Hardin Simmons where the dew falls first from heaven, uh, I, and no cell phone back in the olden days. So I'd get on that black phone that I had in that dorm room in Abilene, Texas, and try to call my mother on Mother's Day. And back in those days, you could try for a long time with that. And on Mother's Day, you'd get for well into the evening, all the circuits are busy. You can't, I didn't even get a busy signal at mom's house. 
I can't even get a call out because everything is so scrambled because so many people are taking up what is available in, uh, in the primitive third world of Abilene, Texas. So, <laughs> have you ever thought about this, that, that uh, God's trying to talk to you? He has a word for you. And all he gets from you is a busy signal? Because your life is so occupied, so filled up with stuff, your calendar so crazy, your mind racing so fast. And the first thing, you know, when you experience, and you're just never quiet, and I guess that's a part of this too. Um, when was the last time you sat down and were quiet for 15 minutes, 10 minutes? I mean, quiet. You stilled your heart and said, God, if you have a word for me today, if you have something to say to me from your book to my spirit, I am available and nothing else. Do you know how hard it is to do that for us today? You do because you probably have a smartphone. And you know, you don't ever sit down for any length of time that you don't have to grab that thing and, and start looking to see what's out there. I was, I was at an intersection uh, heading south on Greenville, taking a left onto Bethany to go to Kroger, because that's what I do on Fridays for fun. I go to the grocery store, because I live that kind of life. And, and so there were three cars in front of me, and they, the, the type of car and how they were staggered, I could see all three drivers from my view as number four car at that light. Wait and turn left. And the light changed, and I could see all four of them. As soon, we all pulled up about the same time. Light goes red. We all stop. And I saw all, all three of them in front of me pull out a cell phone. And uh, the, I'm watching. The light changed. First car. And you see the shock, and he takes off second car they're still on their phone you can see they're still on their phone and then they take off the third car in spite of the first two cars just going forward car number three if either of these people were you I'm looking for you <laughs> third car fourth car I'm waiting for the next light because they took up the whole time. That's, and that's how much tragedy I've had this week. I think your life is tough. Yeah. So there comes a point where you just need some quietness, where you put, you put everything else aside, and you just say, hey, God, is there anything you need to say to me? Because I, I'm open to hearing it. I'm available to hear it. And if you focus on God, the first thing when you experience a loss, or you're coming out of a tragedy, focus on him. And that, that thing that Jeremiah said in the message paraphrase, you know, Jesus, and I'll read this from Matthew 6, 6, just to give you a different feel for it. Jesus said the same thing. Here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you don't, won't be tempted to role play before God. You're not doing it for show. And just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage the focus should shift from you to God and you will begin to sense his grace. Tragedies do have a way of refocusing our attentions. It, sometimes it's just for a moment and then we bounce off to whatever else we're, is on our agenda. But at least slows us down for just a moment. And maybe it helps to focus on the things that really matter in life. And I really believe that with God's people, if he can't get your attention long enough, I think he'll get your attention. And I've had that conversation with many of you that, well, we're just blowing and going and taking care of business and busy and all that stuff. And God just shut me down. And laid in a hospital room, well, he had my attention. At a funeral home, he had my attention. And all those other things just didn't matter so much anymore. And sometimes crisis just brings us to hear a word from God that we really needed a long time ago. Second thing is ask God to remove your fears. Fear is a big part of this. In a tragedy, we feel plenty of emotions. You're going to feel grief because you lose something. Confusion, doubt, anger, frustrations. 
And all those are emotions that you, you have to deal with. But the one emotion more deadly, damaging than all the others really is fear because fear will paralyze you. Fear of, oh my goodness, so this has happened. What else could happen? And all of a sudden, you pull back. After a tragedy, you have to deal with the root of your fears and anxieties. Here's what Jeremiah prays in Jeremiah 3. I called on your name, Lord, from the depths of the pit. That's a great descriptive word. Any of you ever, any of you ever prayed from the depths of the pit? From the depths of the pit, you heard my plea. Do not ignore my cry for relief. You came near whenever I called to you. You said, do not be afraid. What reduces fear in our lives about what else could happen or what things are happening or what's going to happen to me? What reduces fear is faith. And I'll tell you how this works. Faith does not eliminate feelings of fear. It gives you the courage to do what you need to do in spite of your fears, in spite of how you feel. And at those times of faith, God says, I'll give you the courage, the power, the energy, the stamina to press on in spite of the very thing you fear the most. And most of us have something that this is what I fear the most. If this happened, what would I do? The antidote to fear is a relationship to God. And the more you get to know God, the more you're going to have his truth and his love and his grace in your life. The truth will set you free. You need some freedom from, from tragedy, from fear, from struggle. The truth will set you free. Jesus said that. Perfect love drives out fear. Wow, the Bible tells us that too. Faith is our victory. Another good Bible verse. Victory, especially over our fears. The antidote is not a formula. It's not a poster on the wall. It's not a just press forward, pick myself up by my own bootstraps, try harder, just stop feeling that way. The, the cure for our fears is a person. And his name is Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, the better you get to know him, the less fear is going to dominate your life. The Bible says, this is Psalm 34, I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. And sometimes I think God's just waiting for us to ask. You feel it. You know it's out there. And he, but but I, I can fix, I'm a fixer. Many of you are fixers. If I try harder, I do the right things in the right way. Maybe the reason God brought you to this service today is just to say to you, do not be afraid. Do not worry. Don't fret. Don't be anxious. And don't forget, God can help you out. You do not have to be afraid. You do not have to be dominated, paralyzed, destroyed by fear. Third thing from Lamentations, believe God will restore you. Uh, restore is a beautiful word in the Bible for me. Expect him to, trust him to, believe it is so. Believe God can help you recover from the tragedy in the middle of it or coming out of it. That he can put together what feels so broken. You can trust God to bring even good out of bad. And uh, he's the only one that can do that. He's the only one who can be meaning out of the most hurtful things in the life of a believer. Jeremiah did this very thing. After losing everything, this is what he prayed. Lamentations 5, 21. Restore us, O Lord, and bring us back to you again. Give us back the joys we once had. That's a prayer worth praying. When you have lost much, when you have suffered much, when you have... You're overwhelmed by life, by circumstances, by hurts, by tragedy. Why don't you pray that prayer back to the Lord? Lord, restore us. Bring us back to you again. Give us the joys we once had. You know, God really specializes in these new beginnings. And he helps people start over from tragedy. He does it all the time. The, the, the phrases in the Bible, like born again, what is more dramatic than born again of overcoming what has been? Born again. Christ is bad things overcome. Getting a new life, a fresh start, a new look, a new lease, a new direction. But in order to have all that, the one thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to trust that God is God. And his word is true and he is powerful. You have to believe and expect and anticipate 
that God will help you and he will restore what's broken. David in Psalm 27, uh, and this verse really uh, is powerful. I marked it up good and I read the Psalms this year. I would have despaired. Any of you despairing? Despairing, no hope, can't move, can't, can't go, can't press on, trapped. I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And I'm going to stop right there because this is a great word. He would have despaired. He knows God's, God's got all the eternal stuff. Some of you have thought these thoughts. Well, I guess I'm destined to forever be miserable, stuck, and broken here. But, you know, heaven's there one of these days. David said, if I thought that that was all there was, and as awesome as that is, I would have despaired if I didn't think that God was going to do some things to put me back together, do some restoration work uh, right here, right now, in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. I would have been wiped out if I hadn't trusted God, he says. If I hadn't believed God, if I hadn't expected that God would help me. So don't resign from life. That's a big part of this. Believe in the restoration process that only God can do. He can put together broken things. That's what he does. And I, I have known people who said, well, I, I, I can't go on. I, I'm going to curl up in the fetal position and suck my thumb, and I'm, I'm just all done here. I'm going to pull back like a turtle in its shell, and I'm not going to press forward that I am never going to be happy again. Don't retreat into resentment. Uh, that only eats you alive. Resentment's a terrible thing. Sometimes we resent, because often in the tragedies and the broken things, somebody else did it to us. I mean, you can put a name and a face to a lot of the hurts in our lives, right? People who just wronged you, and you can resent them and resent them, and that doesn't really affect them at all. They, they're skipping along, doing their own thing, and happy as a lark. Meanwhile, resentment's eating away at your very soul. Because resentment only affects you. You can be angry at God. And I know people who've just shaken an angry fist at God for years because of something that happened to them. And Well, you're not damaging God, but you're damaging yourself because God's the only one that's going to make anything right and anything better and anything whole. Now, there are two things you should do whenever you face a tragedy. One thing is to accept the things that can't be changed. That's... Uh, that's just good advice. Except the things that can't be changed. You can curse the darkness all day long and it's not going to get any more light. You can say, this is the reality that has been entrusted to me and I don't understand why God has chosen to do it this way, but I'm going to, I'm going to accept this new reality and I'm going to press forward from here because there are a lot of things in my life I have discovered that I can't control. I can control some things. Most things I really don't have a lot of control Acceptance is key to peace and getting on with your life. The second thing is to focus. And you can focus for a long time on what you've lost. And that's just going to drag you down too. Or you can focus on what you still have. So instead of focusing on what you don't have, focus on what you do have. Because here's one of the things that really wrecks depression and grief and brokenness it is a thankful heart. Give thanks in all things, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So be, a th be thankful for the things you do have, and it takes away a lot of hurt. So I read, uh, and I'm plowing through a lot of scripture right now. When, uh, let's see, yesterday, I read Jonah. It's a short, short little book. Jonah's a fun read. Jonah... God said, Jonah, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to the people that your people hate, the Assyrians. They're real jerks. And I want you to go and tell them, give, give them a message from me. He said, oh, yeah, I know how you work, God. I go give them this message, and they're going to turn from all their evil ways. In spite of everything they've done, you're going to forgive them, and this, everything's going to be great for those guys. And I don't want that to happen. So he went in the exact opposite direction that God told him to go. And you remember what happens? He's on a boat. Things aren't going well on the boat, and they finally figure out, well, it's because Jonah's on the boat with us. So they chunk him overboard, and God prepares a large fish to uh, swallow Jonah. 
Jonah's inside the belly of the large fish. And he does what anyone should do. But this is good advice too. If you're ever inside the belly of a large fish. Anybody? If you, you testify to this. If you're inside the belly of a large fish. The first thing you should do is what Jonah did. He prayed. That's a very, very narrow specific application of scripture. But I think it's true. You ought to pray. And he said, as my life was fading away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you in your holy temple. I remembered the Lord. Listen, you don't get over a tragedy instantly and God doesn't expect that either. It takes time to heal. It takes patience. It takes trust to recover from especially big tragedy. But if you focus on him and you ask him to take away your fears... You can expect him to work, and he will find the way to restore joy to your life. And I, I, I do know that no matter what you go through, God can redeem it. Fourth thing, remember in your losses, in your storm, coming out of the storm in the cleanup, life is constantly changing. It just changes all the time. And... <sighs> Tragedy just changes things faster. Tragedy comes unexpectedly, suddenly, sometimes. And tragedy just uh, pedal to the metal on changing things. One moment somebody you love is there, and the next minute they're not there. And there's just this instant change. And there's some things in your life that are just going to change. But there are some things in your life that never change. And you need to find what those things are. And you need to anchor, Jeff, Jeff had us singing about anchors a while ago. You need to anchor your soul to those things that never change because that's what's going to keep you steady in a storm. You fasten, bolt yourself to the unchangeable realities or you're going to be blown around by life circumstances. So Jeremiah does this. And really, no matter what happens in your life, there are three things that are never going to change. There are probably more than that that we could come up with, but Jeremiah decided to mention at least three and so those are the things we want to focus on just now anchor your soul to these things when the storm comes when I'm coming out of the storm and the tragedy has hit when the losses of life come my way I remember that God is still in control uh, I find great hope in that when it feels like it's out of control nothing has not got off of his throne of heaven he is still sovereign over all. And in spite of the tragedies, because we live in a broken world where uh, sinful people are, are going are gonna to run into our lives. And, and sometimes broken things are going to fall right on top of us. And there are any number of things that happen because we live in a world that is stained by sin, broken by... Uh, by the fall of Adam and Eve and, and on. And so we have people with free will around us who are going to make bad choices and then people get hurt. But God can take those things and see, still make those things work together for good to those who love God or are called according to his purpose. He still can, can do those things, but he does give us some freedoms. The reason, I think the reason our lives become so filled with fear is because there's just a lot of things that we can't control. And it's the lack of control that, that makes us fear things. Uh, all, think of all the major things in your life that you don't have any control over at all. I didn't control who my parents were. I didn't control what time period in history I would be born. Um, I didn't control where I was going to be born. But see, I was born in the United States of America. That means I won the birth lottery just because that's where God chose to have me be born. I could have been born in a third world place. My life would be a lot different than this. They're, they're, these, are, these are all things you do not control. You don't control what natural gifts you were given. You don't know when you're gonna, when you're gonna die or how you're gonna die. You don't, control the, you don't control the economy. You don't control the weather. Neither does any weatherman in DFW. We've got plenty of evidence of that. You don't control the past. You don't control the future. You can't even control what's going to happen this afternoon. The one thing you can control is how you respond to these things. Uh, your, your attitude that would reflect Christ in relationship to these things. 
You cannot control the things that are being thrown at you. You can only control how you choose to respond to them. And you respond in faith, in trust, in love. The truth is, I cannot handle most things. Certainly can't handle everything that's going to come my way. But I don't have to. Because I know Jesus is my Savior. And I recognize God will not leave me or forsake me. And he's still in control. And I remind myself, it's out of my control, but it is not out of God's control. And what I've found over time, even when things seem to go crazy, and I've had, I've had a couple of key experiences in my adult life that uh, just reminded me in a dramatic way, I cannot control some things. I can't make some things happen. I can't make it better. I can't make it different. But I found in both cases I could trust God. So I remember no matter what happens, God's in control. Jeremiah said this, our hearts, he's speaking on behalf of his people now, our hearts are sick and weary, our eyes grow dim with tears, but Lord, you remain the same forever. Your throne continues from generation to generation. God, I know you're still in control, even when it feels like all the wheels are coming off of the world. Second thing, we need to remember that God still loves me. I need to remember God still loves me. By the way, he's not going to stop loving me. God still loves you, and he's not going to stop loving you. Other people may stop loving me, but God never will. The other people are going to fail you. They're going to come up short, but God never will. Jeremiah says, remember, he's praying, remember my affliction and my homelessness, the wormwood and the poison. I continually remember them, and I become depressed, yet... I call this to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish. His mercies never end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. You ever wonder where the hymn, Great is Your Faithfulness, came from? It came from Lamentations. This book that is crying out to God. That's where the declaration, Great is Thy Faithfulness, comes from. And that's the prayer we need to be praying every day. He'll never stop loving us. Anchor your soul to that. Third thing, he says, just remember, I have to remember, God's, God's all I need. I think I need a lot of other things. And when those things go away, I think, oh, this is a big deficit in my life. And sometimes that's very personal. And sometimes it's very relational, what goes away. But God's all I need. You're never going to know God is all you need until God is all you have until there's nowhere else to turn and there's nowhere else to look and he brings you to the end of yourself. And, and I, again, I, I found myself on a couple of key occasions where God just took me to the end of me, into my ability, into my control, into my self-sufficiency. And, and that's where I, I learned my greatest lessons about God really is, really is all I need. He's got the resources Jeremiah says, I say, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will put my hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks him. It is good to wait patiently for the salvation of the Lord. He loves you. And if you look to him, the worst of brokenness, the worst of waywardness, the worst of loneliness will begin to dissipate. And he can start bringing some joy and some peace and some hope back into dark places. Trust him, trust him, trust him.